All right, guys, bang, bang, super excited. Tom is here. Uh, what's going on, man? Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, it's great. Good to be on here. Absolutely. Um, all right, so everyone obviously knows that you are a uh, author of Billy Dollar Whale. Let's talk a little bit about kind of your background before you wrote the book. Uh, where'd you grow up and kind of what did you do uh, before you wrote that book? Well, I grew up in the, in the UK, uh, but I came to Asia as a, young, as a young guy, basically after high school for a year to Indonesia. Um, I, then I, I studied in the UK, got my college degree, and then I came straight back out to Asia. Uh, spent, I've been here for sort of 25 years almost now. Um, so made my, made my career out here. Um, in Southeast Asia, in India, uh, India and Pakistan, did Pakistan for a while. Um, and now I'm based in Hong Kong. So yeah, I've, I've sort of cut my ties with, with the old country. And, and what was the kind of the original allure to, uh, to go to Asia in general? Kind of what brought you there and then why stay? I think as a kid, I'd read, uh, you know, I'd read Marco Polo and I'd seen like the film, The Killing Fields, which I don't know if you guys know, but it's a big film in America, but it's, a, it's about uh, Cambodia. Um, and so I was, I had this sort of dream to be a journalist from very, very young because of those kind of things, you know, Apocalypse Now, uh, films like that. Um, by the time I got here, um, which was the mid nineties, it was more, it was more like the, the end, it was a big, massive economic boom. And so it was very attractive as well because it was the fastest growing place in the world, Southeast Asia at that time which very few people remember now. Um, countries like Indonesia were booming. And so I was attracted to sort of that fast changing uh, lifestyle that was, was happening at that time in those places. And then the Asian cr crash happened in the late 90s. Uh, huge economic crash. And that's when, that's when I moved out here permanently around that time. Got it. And so do you remember the first time that you kind of heard of 1MDB or Joe Lowe and kind of like, wh what was the first interaction you had with this story? So yeah, so obviously that, there's a big gap between moving out here in the 90s and then and then 1MDB. 1MDB, that story sort of started around, well, the fraud started around 2009, um, but they kept it under cover for many years. So this was a, you know, just to quickly recap for your listeners, this was a, a, an amazing fraud where a young 28-year-old at the time, a guy called Joe Lowe, persuades a Malaysian prime minister to let him set up a fund. Um, and they borrowed billions of dollars with the help of Goldman Sachs and then they steal, they just steal all the money. And um, like they steal, uh, we think between six and $7 billion, something like that. Um, so the story first came out in 2015 when a, a woman called Claire Rucastle Brown at the Sarawak Report, which is a, like a muckraking website uh, focused on Malaysia and a newspaper in Malaysia called The Edge got hold of an email server from a sort of disgruntled employee who'd been involved with one of the companies that was involved in the fraud, which we can get into later about how all this happened. Um, and those email servers sort of laid out some of the, the ways in which Jolo had stolen some of his early money. Um, and that was really the first time that people were, uh, realized what a huge fraud was going on here. But it was only like a very, it only, those emails only painted a tiny, shone a tiny light onto a tiny part of this fraud, which you know, then took years to investigate. Got it. And, and I think the interesting part uh, when I read the book was this wasn't like a stranger met the prime minister of Malaysia. And next thing you know, there's billions of dollars flowing in his pocket, right? There was kind of some, some ties, mutual friends. Maybe talk a little bit about the relationship that Joe Lowe, who uh, is a Wharton grad, but still relatively young in his 20s. How does he end up building the rapport with, um, you know, what is one of the world leaders uh, and, and kind of setting all of this up? Well, Jolo was kind of lucky. He, so he went to Wharton in the U.S. He went to he went to uh, Eton in uh, the U.K. or Har Harrow, sorry, I should say. And what what he was able to do was meet the kids. He was from a fairly well-to-do family himself, a, a Malaysian business family, Chinese Malaysians. But he was able to meet all these extremely powerful, the kids of extremely powerful families, including the kid of uh, the the child of of, of Najib Brazak, who would become Malaysia's prime minister. What Jolo does, he goes to Wharton. He does he does he gets a um, an economics degree or a, or a business degree instead of um, going and getting a job at Wall Street or, or you know, a, a standard sort of consulting job. He just tries to, to broker deals between the Middle Easterners that he's met, the, the families of rich Middle Easterners, and then uh, Najib Razak back in Malaysia, like bringing Middle Eastern money into Malaysia. And he's a brilliant networker. And back then, this is like 2005, 2006, he's able to bring in you know, hundreds of, of millions of dollars of Middle Eastern money to, to get involved in, in infrastructure projects in Malaysia. Um, so when Najib Razak becomes the prime minister in 2009, 2008, 2009,
Um, Jolo is, is, is his sort of right hand man. And he's only this 28 year old guy with no, who's never really held down a proper job. And he persuades the prime minister to set up this fund called 1MDB. Now this is after the, the, the great financial crisis in the US and in the Europe. Um, there's a lot of money looking to, to invest uh, in Asia at that time. And they set up this fund, they raise billions of dollars and it's, the fund is supposed to improve the lives of Malaysians by you know, creating jobs. But what it really does is, it, uh, well, it doesn't actually do anything, really. I mean, they just steal the money and use it. And we should go on to talk about what they use it to do, which is, which is really incredible. For sure. And, and to me, the part that I think is interesting here is Joe Lowe kind of understands uh, what I'd call the basics of how to commit this fraud, right? The, the thing, whole idea of like, how do I set up a shell company in the Caribbean to ver look very, very similar to a Middle Eastern funds name, but obviously it's not. And so he, he kind of uh, socially engineers to some degree, uh, whether you know intentionally or just by accident, um, a lot of trust in the system and, and billions and billions of dollars, as you mentioned, kind of flow to him. Um, any kind of idea in terms of like, was that something where people were literally just ignorant and kind of, uh, you know, almost just being dumb and, and overlooking it? Or was there some intentionality there where people kind of knew what was going on, but they didn't care because they were benefiting in some way and, and the money was still flowing? That's a great question. So for example, he steals, I mentioned Goldman Sachs helped the fund raise this, these billions of dollars worth of bonds. So this isn't money that the fund had, they went out and raised it. Then they were supposed to send that money uh, some of that money to a uh, a partner in the Middle East called IPIC, which is another big uh, investment fund in the uh, UAE, the United Arab Emirates. But what they do, as you just mentioned, is they set up a lookalike company that looks like IPIC, um, but it's in the in the BVI, it's a British Virgin Island shell company. Now, of course, you couldn't do that without the connivance of the person who was really running IPIC, which was a guy called Karim Hal Kabesi. So it's insanely corrupt. You've got on the Malaysian side, you've got the prime minister who's involved in this. Right, so you have the cover on the Malaysian side. Jolo's running it, running this fund. And on the other side, on the Arab, on the Arab side, you have Karim Makabezi, who's running a multi-billion-dollar fund, huge fund. Um, it, had, it had invested in, uh, you know, Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic and those kind of things. So it's a proper company, um, and and everyone knows it's going to the fake IPIC, not the real IPIC. Um, but the, but the share, I guess, the boards of those companies don't know. Um, and then the other question is, well, how, how, was all, how were all these billions of dollars able to flow um, when international banks that did the transactions were supposed to catch it too? Because of course, if you do a dollar transaction, the, U, uh, the US banks are supposed to catch it, right? Um, correspondence banks like Wells Fargo, which who were involved, or you know, Goldman itself. Um, and what Billion Dollar Well shows is that every step of the way, they did not, nobody caught this stuff. And your question, was it willful? Was it, you know, everyone was making a lot of money. And so maybe some, sometimes it was people had the wool pulled over their eyes, but at others, it was willful ignorance to, to make cash and make bonuses. Yeah, and the part to me, if I understand correctly, is the billions of dollars that were raised by Goldman for the bonds, they made about $600 million in fees, which is uh, comparably kind of pretty outrageous fee structure. And so it was almost like, uh, hey, we're making so much money on this, maybe we won't ask as many questions. Uh, is that, was that your take on the situation as well? Yes, 100%. I mean, so what, what happened was that the fund went, Jolo went to a guy called Tim Leisner, who was a partner of Goldman in Asia, who's now pleaded guilty to, to helping steal $200 million. And his sentencing is, is, is still to come. Um, he, and, he, and they said, look, we need, to, we need to raise all this money. Now, did everyone at Goldman know that the money was going to be stolen? No, I don't think that is, that is the case. But there were huge red flags that at every stage of the way were missed. Um, so Goldman is saying this guy, Tim Leisner, the former partner, was a rogue banker. Okay, that's their defense. But I think it's not as simple as that. I think a lot of people at Goldman knew, knew that there were problems here. For example, the fund in Malaysia asked, they raised $3 billion bond, and they asked for it to be put into a Swiss bank account that the fund had. Now, why would a sovereign fund in Malaysia have a Swiss bank account? And Goldman's lawyers, Linklaters, actually raised questions about this in real time. It wasn't as if this is all hindsight. And they just said, well, you know, this bank's not on any money laundering or terrorism blacklist, so let's just do it. And everyone was making huge, huge bonuses. And so that was the problem. Um, you know, compliance were telling, uh, Goldman's compliance was saying, do not deal with this guy, Jolo. They turned him down for a private bank account. It was pretty obvious because you couldn't, this guy had billions of dollars, but if you did a Google search, you couldn't, and he was claiming it was family money, 
Um, but if you did a, a Google search, you couldn't find any mention of him, right? And so the, the fact that all these transactions went through is just astounding. Yeah, and so when you say that they raised these bonds, where did that money come from? Is this institutions buying into the bonds? Is this retail investors? Where, where are the billions of dollars kind of originally flowing from? Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, this is a post uh, financial crisis. There's a lot, there's obviously low interest rates, negative interest rates, a lot of liquidity and not that many investments to make in the US and, and the US stock market was down. I mean, Lloyd Blankfein, who was then CEO of uh, Goldman is telling people, you know, go out to Asia let's be Goldman in more places was the quote he, he, he said at that time, which meant go and find in places to invest and, and deals to do that aren't in Europe and, and the US, you know, before they recovered. Um, and so that, that's why uh, investors were so willing to snap up these, uh, these bonds. And they were, they were very, they were very popular. I and mean, they, 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 of course, they also yielded extremely high, high uh, numbers because of the way that they the Goldman and, and the one MDB structured it. Yeah. And so uh, the funniest part to me is uh, the way that you guys write the book, it seems like it's pretty obvious. And, and I'm sure there's some hindsight bias of like, hey, here's all the red flags. But, you know, it would have taken somebody to be intelligent and, and thoughtful and thorough to, to put that together in real time. But it sounds like kind of at each step of the way, somebody was raising red flags. When you zoom out and you look at billions and billions of dollars, uh, the part that sticks out is just the arrogance of Joe Lowe and kind of the other people involved as to what they did with the money, right? And so maybe talk a little bit about like, as you guys are going to write the book, like how do you track down all the assets and kind of, you know, are you just kind of mind blown every time you find more and more ridiculous things that they use the money for? Yeah, well, the big thing, the famous thing that they used the money for was to buy a film company called Red Granite Pictures or to set up a film company called Red Granite Pictures, which went on to make The Wolf of Wall Street with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and they, they made Daddy's Home and Dumb and Dumber 2 and a bunch of other films. So you're talking a little bit about how do we uncover all of this? Well, we actually got hold of the email server of uh, Red Granite Pictures and in there were all the, 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 the cell phone numbers of all the Hollywood stars. And we also then noticed that there were lots of Playboy Playmates in there. Uh, sort of scores of them. And so we just set to doing sort of traditional reporting, which is just calling the numbers and asking to speak to people. So we spoke to, we called like all the Playboy Playmates. And these were the ones who were, were, were in the magazine in 2009, 2010. And we, we finally got one, a woman called Stephanie Larimore, who said, oh yes, I remember uh, Joe Lowe. And um, yeah, we partied with him and Leonardo DiCaprio in uh, the Palazzo in Vegas in 2009. And she told this strange story of like, there being 20 plus playmates, DiCaprio, Jolo, and, and almost no one else um, playing Baccarat and, and partying and dancing. And so that's the chapter in the book called um, An Evening with the Playmates. And the, the, that was Jolo's MO, right? He'd stolen all his money. He was probably one of the most liquid cash guys in the world because he didn't have a real business. He just had the money and he wanted to go and make films. And so he was courting DiCaprio, telling him, we, we'll give you you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to make your next four score films with Scorsese. They were going to make The Irishman before all this, this blew up. Um, and that was, that was how he operated. And he would spend money like nobody's business, right? I mean, you, you, that's the most amazing thing to me. I remember the one story where he, I think it was his birthday party, or maybe he was throwing the birthday party for somebody in an airport hangar. Uh, it's yeah, it was actually a it's the prologue of the book. So for his his thirty first birthday, he hired a vacant lock off, lot off the strip and turned it into sort of like an airport hangar. Um, and it, it was it was like the Oscars. I mean, the the, you know, the, the, the caliber of, of actors who were there, and I mean, people had heard about this guy, and and they didn't really know. I mean, DiCaprio was given lots of gifts from Joe Lo, Picasso paintings and that kind of thing, but there's no idea that these guys knew that he was who he was for fraud. Um, and they gave back these gifts in the end. But I think if you're in Hollywood, you're used to people with a lot of money uh, coming by and financing your film, and you don't necessarily question uh, where they come from, right? And there were all these rumors about Jolo at the time. Is he an arms dealer? Is he a friend of the prime minister? But I think it was, there was a sort of orientalism here. You're able to say, okay, this guy's just out in Asia. Yeah, there's a lot of money in Asia. We don't need to probe much more deeply than that. But it's a massive embarrassment to all the people who, uh, yeah, everyone, I mean, Jamie Foxx would MC for him and take, you know, do a lunchtime speech and take millions. Um, Swizz Beats, Alicia Keys' husband, was hanging with him all the time and getting paid, you know, right up to the very end and even after it was exposed. So it's, it's just an amazing network of this guy. 
Yeah, and, and I guess like, what do those people think about it now, right? I, I mean, you mentioned some pretty big, well-known people. Is it something where they actually are uh, a little embarrassed and maybe like, ah, oh, you know, I got duped a little bit, or was it something where they kind of throw their hands up and say, "Look, we had no clue, we never asked, and uh, you know, frankly, I don't care. I just had a good time and you know, move on with my life." Well, you have to say you got duped because if you didn't get duped, you were you were complicit, right? So, I mean, everyone says they got duped or they just didn't realize. I mean, there's, there's another scene in Billion Dollar Whale where Jordan Belford, who of course is the real Wolf of Wall Street, is on set, he's not on set, so he's at this uh, launch party in the Cannes Film Festival that they put on to say, look, we're this new film company and we're gonna make the Wolf of Wall Street. And he's in the crowd and he says, you know, tell to his girlfriend and he goes, this is a fucking scam. Nobody would spend their own money like this. And what he means is like they spent, they've spent millions on this launch party and they're not even, they haven't even made a film yet. So there were real people, there were people who in real time uh, sorry, as a fraud, right? But, you know, DiCaprio says that he was, he, he just didn't know and that, um, you know, when he found out, he gave the money back. And of course, Jolo went on to date Miranda Kerr, the Australian supermodel, um, and, you know, gave her jewelry worth $8 million. Um, and she also, she, she, she was with him for about a year and she also says, look, I didn't know the true story about this guy. Um, I think people just, you know, they saw her money bags and they didn't bother to ask any questions. That's all I can, all I can say about it. Yeah, um, I looked before uh, before we did this at some of the assets uh, that were reported as um, you know some of the the new information that came out, and uh, I was shocked. So you get multi million dollar properties in you know L.A., New York, London, elsewhere. You've got about a two hundred fifty million dollar yacht. You've got a thirty five million dollar private jet. You've got obviously the uh, see through piano in Miranda Kerr's house. They like can't get out of the house. Um, I mean, it, it was like. You know, you're kind of reading through this list and you're like, what would you do if you never had money before? And now all of a sudden you're given billions of dollars and you could go like spend it on whatever you want. Like this was literally like the Christmas list, right? Yeah, the, the Miranda Kerr's Perspex, uh, Perspex uh, piano that they cannot get out of her Malibu home because they built walls around it. I love that story. Yeah. So, they, so what we should say is in 2016, the, the Department of Justice in the U.S., uh, move to seize all these assets, right? So what happens in the, if you, the U, obviously fraudsters from around the world like to spend their money in the US because you can get bang for your buck. You can buy a hundred million dollar apartment on Central Park and that kind of thing. Um, and they like living there as well. Um, and so Jolo bought, for example, an apartment in the Time Warner Center on Columbus Circle, which had been Jay-Z and, and Beyonce's uh, apartment. Um, he, bought, he, he bought a mansion on the Bird Streets uh, in uh, Los Angeles, which is close to where DiCaprio lives. Um, they actually set up their offices on the same building as DiCaprio's production company on the, on the Sunset Strip. So, um, yeah, he, 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 they really moved into the U.S. in assets in a big way because that was a way to, first of all, he wanted to be a, a big player in the U.S., not just in Hollywood, but also he was looking to buy uh, Reebok from Adidas. He was looking to buy Tom Ford, the maker of James Bond suits. Um, he bought the central. He bought the Park Lane Hotel, the big hotel on Central Park South. Um, so he was he was setting himself. Oh, he became a he became the Asia president of EMI Music Publishing, and he and was involved in that investment too. So he was he was really trying to become a real investor and a, and, and a real billionaire. You know, even though the whole thing was a sham. Yeah, it's almost like if I can steal some money to get started, then I can go and try to become legitimate at some. <laughs> you know, former fashion, uh, which is pretty crazy. Um, obviously, the reason why I wanted to talk is uh, Goldman just announced that there's a new settlement. And so uh, maybe give us a little backstory in terms of kind of what's happened with the Goldman bankers. I think that's kind of a unique situation, some of the prior offers, and then where ultimately this settlement is, is kind of netting out. Yeah, so when this whole thing came crashing down, as I said, these stories started coming out in 2015. And then, you know, we, we spent between 2015 and 2018, writing many different stories and, and writing the book. Goldman at the time was saying, look, I mean, we just did a, <clears throat> at the very beginning, they said, we were just the banker. We just did a, a normal job raising money. We had no idea whether, whether excuse me, I just need to drink. Got a bit of a, got a bit of a sniffle. Not, not COVID, don't worry. Um, uh, they, they said, look, we could not possibly have known where, that this was fraud. We just raised the money, okay? But then, it transpired that the, the main banker on the deal, Tim Leisner, a German national who was a partner and a very senior guy who was actually ended up becoming chairman of Southeast Asia for Goldman. He was, he was in on the fraud and he has admitted that to American investigators now. Um, helped to set up funds to move $200 million around, including to, um, the, he, they even discussed buying jewelry for the wife of, of uh, Najib Razak, the prime minister, who was this, who when she was arrested in Malaysia, 
uh, had $250 million of loose items in her apartments, you know, jewelry and bag, Birkin bags and all that kind of thing. Um, and so it became more and more difficult for Goldman to say nothing had happened. And then they, then they, then they said, well, look, this was a rogue banker. Um, this guy and another guy called uh, Roger Ung, who's also been arrested, who was a Malaysian banker at Goldman. So they said, look, Lloyd Blankfein wasn't involved. Gary Cohen, who was a big, uh, who uh, was the number two at Goldman at the time, who went on to be Trump's economic advisor. These guys weren't involved. But then Malaysia, uh, in two late 2018, they actually um, uh, filed criminal charges against a number of Goldman bankers, uh, senior executives. So what happened uh, just the last few days is Goldman has had to settle with them, with Malaysia, to get those charges dropped. And it's agreed to pay $2.5 billion to Malaysia. Um, now, this is not including the settlement they're going to have to do with the DOJ, the Department of Justice in the US. It doesn't include any criminal. This is just a civil case. It doesn't include any criminal matters in, in the US. Um, and that is five times the amount that Goldman paid in fines after the, the global financial crisis. They paid 500 million for the whole subprime. You remember Abacus, all of that stuff. Only 500, only 500 million, but like a fifth. And this is only just starting. So I don't think people quite realize how, I mean, the book's done well, right? We saw quite a few copies of it and, and people, people like yourself know the story, but I think people don't realize the, the size of this fraud and the implications of it. And when I think, you know, we're hearing, it could be as early as, as next week that uh, Goldman settled in the US. And that's, there's going to be even sort of higher, higher uh, fines. And so this is, all, this is all still to play out. We don't know what the, and then the big question is, will Goldman have to plead guilty? Which of course, that never really happened after the global financial crisis. There are all these deferred prosecution agreements where you, you, you paid a fine, but you didn't plead guilty. So that's all to play out. Yeah, and, and so um, the $2.5 billion settlement is in cash. And then the number that everyone keeps seeing is $3.9 billion. And obviously that $1.4 billion difference isn't in cash. Describe a little bit kind of this whole idea of like guaranteeing assets and, and why is the media reporting a $3.9 billion settlement with Malaysia for only $2.5 billion in cash? Well, the Malaysian government was under a huge pressure to come up with a huge number because they, they've got to show that they're. Um, and what what's Gold, Goldman is doing is paying 2.5 in cash, and then it's then there's 1.4 billion of assets. These assets that the U.S. has seized, which include you know, Jolo's apartment that in in Columbus Circle in the Time Warner building, those kind of things. The 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 initial lawsuits in the U.S. were U.S. versus Wolf of Wall Street. They actually seized the film, the the profits from the film. So what Goldman's saying is we will guarantee that you get back from the US government 1.4 billion. Um, it's been described as a sort of a put, like almost a put, right? Um, but I don't think um, Goldman would have done that if it, if it hadn't looked at the assets and worked out what they're worth and realized that it's not, not a huge risk, right? Goldman doesn't do that kind of thing <laughs> without getting its analysts to really look closely. So that's not really, a I don't really see that as a cost to Goldman. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe the assets will come in at only 700, you know, you know or 70% of what that 1.4 billion, right? Um, but I just think it's unlikely. I mean, it's just, a, it's just a sort of a financial engineering thing, I think. Yeah, and so in exchange for this kind of $2.5 billion in cash and then the guarantee on the assets, uh, it sounds like Malaysia has agreed to basically drop all charges criminally against Goldman as an organization, um, and pretty much everyone except for the two, you know, quote unquote, rogue bankers, or, or is that incorrect? No, that's uh, that's totally correct. So, the, so, the, so then these two rogue bankers. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not calling them rogue bankers because I actually think they were there were more people that knew about it that were that were um, at least turning a blind eye. Um, but yeah, these two bankers, um, Tim Leisner and Roger Ung, they have got criminal cases ongoing against them in in the U.S. And as I said, uh, Roger Ung has said has pleaded not guilty, but Tim Leisner has pleaded guilty and he's been cooperating. Um, and so his sentencing should, I mean, it's been postponed a number of times since last summer, but everyone's waiting to see what happens there because um, I don't, I mean, I can't imagine his cooperation was that useful because it's not as if they've rounded up and charged a bunch of other Goldman bankers, right? So, you know, the, like Goldman's uh, argument that this was a rogue is, I guess, partly true, but the, but the point is, there were a lot of other people that knew there were red flags because, you know, in the, in the emails that we've seen, for example, they, they all talk about, oh, we must keep Jolo out of this. You know, we'll do business with him, but we can't be seen to be doing business with him. So I think, I think the knowledge of the shadiness of this practice went much deeper at Goldman than just those two bankers. 
Yeah, and my understanding from uh, kind of reading some of the news reports after I read the book was, um, I think it's Tim Leisner has given back like $40 million and kind of there's a bunch of money that's moving around. And, and frankly, when you're talking about billions of dollars in a fraud, any number smaller than a billion kind of seems small, right? But for an individual to kind of turn over $40 million, one, like that's what supposedly or he's allegedly earned from doing these deals. Uh, so as a personal income, like pretty big number, and then to actually turn around and give it back uh, as part of these, you know, pleading guilty, whatever. What is interesting though, you mentioned the $500 million that Goldman paid during the global financial crisis, and now you've got 2.5 billion here, but the global financial crisis also, I don't, it was definitely nobody at Goldman that I know of was arrested. I don't think kind of anyone really across Wall Street was really arrested uh, on the criminal side. And so kind of how do you see that playing out in the U.S.? So you've got two guys who've pleaded, uh, one guy's pled guilty, one who's pled not guilty, but this feels very different and feels like actually there are going to be some people who, who get in trouble here. Well, I think this is, I mean, I'm guessing or I'm hoping at least this is when it really is going to get into the it's going to go wider in the US and more people will be aware of it as a story, not just, you know, financial types or people like reading business books or, you know, I mean, the Hollywood angles already let it jump over a little bit to that, that audience. But, um, and I think when a Goldman banker, a partner is sentenced to jail, if, if that happens, which I can't see, I mean, I would be surprised if there was any other outcome that's going to, that's going to generate a lot of headlines because like you said, after the financial crisis, nobody did. Well, I think there was one banker from Credit Suisse who went to jail, and I think that was it. Um, really wasn't. There really wasn't very much. You remember Fabulous Fab, uh, who was the Goldman banker, who was who, who talked about selling products to widows and orphans and all of that. But the, but there wasn't really very much criminal sanction um, after the global financial crisis, as we as we just said. There's, there were a lot of deferred prosecution agreements where you pay a fine and you you don't admit guilt. Um, so the big thing that Goldman Goldman's lawyers now. Um, Kirkland and Ellis, um, which is a Bill Barr, Attorney General Bill Barr's old firm, are um, uh, negotiating very, very hard with the Department of Justice to not plead guilty. Um, the Wall Street Journal had a story earlier this year that they that they had agreed in in principle to plead guilty at the Singapore unit level, which is which it fits their rogue narrative uh, narrative uh, their rogue banker narrative, right? Which is it all happened under Tim Leisner in the Singapore office. Um, Whereas I think a lot of people at DOJ want to have Goldman plead guilty at the firm level. So that's, that's a really important thing to watch. What is the difference there, right? Obviously it's kind of the whole company versus a, a single office, but kind of what are the ramifications of if the guilty plea came in at the firm level versus a single office? Well, Lloyd Blankfein was the chief executive during all of this. He, he was the chief executive during the subprime meltdown. He was the chief executive during the whole Libyan debacle, which you might know about. Um, and then he was the chief executive for this. He left in the fall of 2018. And so the question is, did he, did he retire? Was he pushed out? His, his, his options have actually been uh, suspended. Uh, some of his pay has been suspended while, uh, pending the end of this investigation. Um, so it, it's a huge question whether it's firm-wide or whether it's, uh, it's only at the Singapore unit. Because if it's firm-wide, then, then the very top dogs at the bank have to admit uh, their role in it, or that they failed in their oversight. Um, Lloyd Blankfein met Joe Lowe at least on two occasions, I believe, um, in in New York in Goldman's headquarters. In, on one occasion, um, you don't get to see Lloyd Blankfein unless you you know you're vetted. And I think he met him with with Natchev at one point. Now Goldman would would say, look, he was uh, an em you know he was seen as an emissary of um, Najib. Najib was the prime minister. How could we have known? But you know, don't forget it, at that time, Goldman's compliance department was saying, "Don't open a private bank account for this Joe Lowe guy," right? And Goldman are very smart. You know, they know they they knew who Joe Lowe was. I, I can't believe they could say, "Well, you know, Blankfein met him and didn't know who he was." Um, and and there were all these questions about, you know, don't do deals with him. And even after one MDB, even after this whole fraud collapsed, um, there were there were Goldman bankers in the Middle East, a guy called Hazem Shalki, who continued to do deals with Joe Lowe. Um, with compliance telling him, look, you've got to keep Jolo. You can't, you can't, you can't do the deal directly with Jolo. Jolo has to be on the other side. And they did, they did these these investment deals. It's a very complicated story, but the point is, you know, they knew Jolo was there. They knew they had questions about Jolo, but they did all this business anyway because the fees were just so 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 high, right? 
Yeah, capitalism drives a uh, drives a very specific type of uh, activity. Um, what do you think happens in the U.S. Right, so there's the guilty plea or not guilty plea, kind of wherever that comes out. Um, but from a fine perspective, are you expecting something that's going to be bigger than the 2.5 billion dollar settlement with uh, the Malaysian government? Smaller, kind of. Just talk me through, you know, what your expectations, I guess, are right now. Well, I, went, I actually went on Squawk Box um, with Andrew Ross Sorkin maybe a couple of years back now or 18 months ago. And I said, he asked me what fines you think uh, they would do. And I said that, that they would put on Goldman. And I said the U.S. would put a fine of $2 billion. And very senior Goldman executives phoned up the Wall Street Journal and complained at that time, right, that this was like, you know. How, and, and, and the yardstick then was, well, J.P. Morgan had been fined $2 billion for uh, Bernie Madoff's accounts, which they had failed to, to signal the red flags, right? This is all done under the Bank Secrecy Act. It's not a, it's not a criminal matter. This is, you know, you're fined for failing to uh, see red flags and act upon them and tell authorities. And so if it's anywhere in the, in the sort of uh, JP Morgan range, it could be another 2 billion and that could be four up to 5 billion. But the question is, does the Malaysian, how does the Malaysian fine relate to the US fine? Is, is there some sort of like overall number that Goldman has organized and they have to give it to Malaysia, not the US? I mean, I don't, I'm not quite sure on that. So um, we'll have to just wait and see, yeah. And then the criminal matter is a, is a separate thing. That's just, that's rolling through the courts, right? Yeah, it, it's very interesting to me. Um, I, I read the book uh, Black Edge, which is about Steve Cohen and SAC Capital. Uh, this situation seems Great very sim similar in that, um, you know, th there's almost this like weird negotiation. I think the kind of the average person hears, oh, there's law enforcement involved at, you know, whether it's the federal level or whatever. Hey, they're just going to say you're in trouble. You know, here's your charges, go to court. And, uh, and basically you get whatever uh, judgment you get, right? But here there is very much this negotiation, like you talked about when lawyers are going in and, and kind of they have the, here's what we're willing to do, here's what we're not willing to do, here's how much we're willing to pay. And then the negotiation starts. And so it almost feels like um, kind of the richer, the more powerful uh, you are, the more leverage you have in these scenarios because it's Goldman Sachs on the other side from the DOJ, not you, know, you me, or any other individual. Yeah, and like I mentioned, it's a revolving door problem. I mean, Goldman's lawyers are Kirkland and Ellis, Bill Barley, AG, used to work there. I mean, there's no, he, I, I'm not sure he's recused himself on, uh, on it. I'm not, I, I think he got a waiver. Um, so that, so um, the, the question is, why has there not already been a settlement? This, this, these stories started coming out in 2015. The, the, the Civil uh, Department of Justice attempts to take the assets started in 2016. We're now in 2020, so I have, I'm, I have huge questions about, I mean, our book came out almost two years ago. Um, I think the broad contours of this have, have been known for, for a while, right? And so why, why has there not been a settlement so far? Well, yeah, exactly. There's a, there are very powerful lawyers that have to negotiate with the Department of Justice to, to, um, to try to work out what Goldman's willing to pay and willing to do. Um, and that, that's a fascinating process to watch. Um, and of course, Goldman says, as I mentioned, they say, look, we, we didn't know. They, they, this is the line they'll be pushing very hard. We just didn't know that, you know, Lloyd Blankfein did not know that, that Tim Leisner, the partner, was, was dealing corruptly with Joe Lowe. And I think that's probably right, actually. But, it's, but it's, it, on, on every other level, it, you know, is it true that Goldman didn't know that there were red flags here? And that, I mean, well, demonstrably not, because their, their own compliance department, you know, knew that there was problems opening an account for him. So. So that so yeah, but Goldman is Goldman is obviously an extremely powerful institution and is able to has been able to sort of stretch this out over, over a long period of time. Yeah, it's obviously a very, very complex situation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your process in writing the book. So I asked people for questions beforehand and, and a couple of people asked, you know, some variation of just uh you're dealing with a lot of money, uh, very fraudulent, complex situation, very powerful people, um, or people who are uh, very egotistical. What were some of the things that people did to stop you from either getting information, getting access to people, or really kind of being able to complete the body of work? Well, at one point I was in Malaysia reporting in, um, in, uh, in a hotel in Malaysia. And Bradley Hope, who's the co-author of the book, my great friend, he was called up by one of our sources who was close to the Malaysian prime minister and told, look, um, the Malaysian prime minister is trying, is thinking of arresting Tom in Malaysia and, and he should really get out of the country. And it was framed as a, as a sort of friendly advice, but actually it was like this person we later found out was, you know, in cahoots with the prime minister. And so things like that, just trying to stop us uh, reporting on the ground. Um, 
lot of legal threats, crazy number of legal threats. You know, so for example, we'd, we'd write to, um, I don't know, Christie's, for example, who did a lot of, uh, Jolo became one of the biggest buyers of art in the world. Um, and they would immediately write a bunch of questions from what we were going to say in the book, which was very sort of, you know, fact based. And they'd write back with a very, very aggressive um, letter. Um, same with uh, Tepperberg and Strauss, who are these two guys who run the Marquee nightclub in New York and, and Labo in, in, in Vegas. You know, very aggressive legal letter back when you said to them, look, uh, we're going to say that you were, uh, you organized all of Jolo's parties over a long multi-year period and were paid, you know, a lot of money to do so. Um, and so, you, you, you know, it was very stressful at that time because we were fact-checking. You know, in the book, it's an almost 400-page book and there's an allegation on almost every page. And so we, were, we, we checked with every single person. I think at one point, you know, the, the prologue of the book is this big party we mentioned on, on, in the, you, mentioned, you, you called it an aircraft hangar. It almost looked like an aircraft hangar. We, we talked to every single person who was supposed to be there. So at one point, I think we called up Jonah Hill's agent and said, you know, was Jonah Hill there? And they, they said, oh, actually, he was supposed to go, but he was on the guest list we had, but he didn't turn up. So, you know, it was super fact-checked. Um, and people did, pe people would just, they would do anything to try to stop the book. And then, uh, sorry, I, 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 the elephant in the room is Jolo's lawyers, uh, Shillings. Um, they sent letters to all the bookshops that were going to carry this book around the world saying, if you stock this, you could be liable to a defamation suit, which was nonsense because why would a bookshop, I mean, it's the writer of the book that should get a defamation suit. But it was all, it was all just a, a tactic to scare people not to have the book. And it was, it was, it's what's called the Streisand effect, which is when Barbara Streisand tried to stop people posting her photos and everyone ended up looking at them, right? The book just got like much more attention <laughs> because of all that. So none, none of it worked, but the truth comes out eventually. It's literally like the perfect book to write, right? I mean, you've got financial fraud, billions of dollars, a bunch of famous people, very powerful people. I mean, just literally, you know, it kind of sells itself to some degree. Um, were you ever able to talk to Joe Lowe's attorneys or to Joe Lowe himself? Um, yeah, we, we, we definitely talked to his attorneys and sent lots of questions to him via them, but they, they, have, not, they have not engaged Shillings um, and Cobry and Kim, who are the, his lawyers in the U.S., did not engage with us in any way over a multi-year period. I mean, they would engage with us, but just with pro forma, letters saying that we, you know, we're not doing, we're not allowing his side out, but they never answered any, uh, he, Jolo via his lawyers has not until today answered any substantive questions. Um, and we should talk about where Jolo is, by the way. So one of my questions is going to be where, uh, where do you think he is? Well, I mean, I, well, we knew he was in China at one point. So, so we should say the, the lawsuits, the civil lawsuits, 2016 in the U S and then in 2018, the U S and Malaysia both um, file criminal charges against Jolo. Um, and at the same time, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Najib Razak, loses power in an election in Malaysia, and he's, he's arrested. Um, and I think his, Najib's verdict, by the way, might come out today um, in Asia or, or tomorrow or something like that. So um, <clears throat> Jolo is told by the Prime Minister to, to get out of the country, and he goes to China. Um, and this is, this is where the story gets very complicated, but it's just unbelievably interesting. He's able to do deals. So, so Najib at that point is still uh, prime minister. It's before he loses power in the elections. And he's able to do these infrastructure deals with China and Malaysia. And they steal even more money. This is not the 1MDB fraud. This is just post 1MDB to use to, to, to fill some of the holes. And he uses the, a friend in Kuwait who's the former prime minister's son. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and he's able, to, he's able to sort of keep doing deals. And uh, China has not... Um, said anything about it, but we got minutes of a meeting. We know that Jolo's protector in China at one point was a guy called Sun Li Jun, who was uh, head of the domestic security forces. That guy has just been um, arrested for corruption in China um, without any comment by, the, by Xi Jinping's government. So what we, we believe there's a sort of a clearing of house going on in China about this, but Jolo is still there. And of course, he's a very useful pawn for anyone who, who holds him, right? Because you know, he knows all this stuff um, about where the money's gone. He, he still controls a lot of money, too. And he's still paying his lawyers, um, which we don't understand how, how he can do. But he's still paying his lawyers in the U.S., millions of dollars. So, so uh, any idea where he is in China or just kind of the, the general idea is just in China somewhere? Well, this isn't a joke. He was definitely in Wuhan at one point. We have, we have sort of intelligence that he was in Wuhan. Um, this is before the, um, the, the virus started. Um, since then, to be honest, I d that would be very early this year or, or actually late last year. Since then, I don't know exactly where he is, but um, I, I, I'm not sure whether he can travel. It's possible he can travel or until recently he's been able to travel into the Middle East, the UAE. 
to, because a lot of people are trying to cover this up, right? For example, um, the UAE was involved, were involved in this. The Sheikh Mansour, the owner of Man City uh, uh, Football Club, soccer club in the US, in, uh, in England, um, he, his boat, the $650 million Topaz, which is now called the A+, was partly financed with money from, stolen from 1MDB. So there's, there's, no, there's a lot of people who don't really want this, you know, uh, to be raked over. And so he's, it's possible Jolo can travel to those countries too on private jets. But I imagine the Chinese authorities are keeping him pretty much in their sights, right? Because um, they want to control him. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and is the thought process when you say he's got control over money, is that something that is just nobody really understands, but he's obviously paying some of these bills that we know are, are expensive? Or is it something where um, we think he's literally walking around with duffel bags of cash? Or kind of how do you think that somebody who uh, is really this like international uh, wanted man? Uh, still has control over money and can kind of do some things. Well, he moved money into Chinese Yuan for sure, because when he was trying to pay off some of these corrupt deals I just mentioned, they were moving it around via ICBC, which is a Chinese bank in Yuan. And the reason to do that is to avoid, uh, if you do a dollar transaction, you could end up getting caught by the correspondent bank, right? It has to be, it has to be checked. And so he's basically been frozen out of the US system, but he's, I think he's still got access to, to Thai baht or Chinese Yuan and all, of, uh, all these currencies. He tried to buy a bank in, I think the Comoros Islands at one point uh, post all this coming out, right? So you can control money. And obviously China is becoming a bigger, bigger player in the global economy. And so you can do stuff with Yuan and, you, and, it's, and it's not, you know, it's, it's to a degree a bit more internationalized than it used to be, even though they still have a closed capital, uh, capital account, right? Um, so that's, that's, I think, how he's operating. Um, but it's incredible to me that the big question I have is Cobra, uh, Cobra and Kim, right? His lawyers, they're, they're, they're a big law firm, Shillings in the UK. They're getting paid money. Um, they... Cobra and Kim uh, had to file a form, a FARA form, which is to show to the U.S. government that they're lobbying for him. And they're not, they're not obviously paid by him. They're paid, they were paid by a Thai guy, a Thai friend of Jolo's. But, but I don't understand how you can say, well, you know, we know that this money is not the proceeds of crime. You know, lawyers, everyone's, everyone's allowed a lawyer, right? And, that's, uh, and Jolo has not been proven guilty. You know, he's, he's only, he's only been, he hasn't turned up to face the charges, but he hasn't been proven guilty. So that's fair. He needs a lawyer. But for, but for, for when it comes to um, taking lawyers taking money to do lobbying, to send letters to try to stop a book being published, like a billion dollar whale, I mean, then I have questions about, well, how, do, how are those lawyers proving that the, the, the money was not tainted? Um, extremely, extremely interesting situation. Yeah, the, the part to me that I think just blows my mind is you've got a guy who uh, it almost seems in some weird way uh, has a very tainted reputation, but has become emboldened after the scam was uh, uncovered. Like you, you almost get like one of these weird things where you, you could imagine this guy is like bragging about the fact that there's a book written about him and he just forgets the part of like that it's written about a scam. Right, like, like it's almost like the, the fame and the, the egotistical nature of all of this is driving him to do more and more to some degree, it, it sounds like, from some of these stories? Well, his, well, his favorite book, um, we learned, was uh, the book about Mark Rich. So Mark, Mark Rich was the oil trader who ended up getting um, uh, charged in the U.S., and he lived his life out in Switzerland on, on the shores of Lake Lugano in a, in a luxurious villa. And, and I think Jolo sort of saw this guy as his model in a way, and, and, and Rich was pardoned by Bill Clinton on his last day in office. Um, and so I think Jolo really saw that as his end game to get a sort of a pardon. Um, and this, as I said, the story is super complicated, but making it even more complicated, the, the, the party of Najib Razak, the former prime minister who's been arrested, um, is, is now coming back to power in Malaysia. And so there's this idea that maybe all the charges will get dropped in Malaysia if that party solidifies its grip on power. And then Jolo might be able, might actually be able to come back to the country. I mean, it's not, un, not, not unbelievable. I mean, it's a very, very corrupt place. So. Is his family still in Malaysia? No, they're all on the run with him. I mean, I think his dad has been charged by the, the Malaysian government. Um, so there was a change of power in Malaysia and the new government pushed ahead with all this, these charges. But then that government is now out of power again. And so, you know, it's a, it's a fluid situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in terms of writing the book, uh, were there any kind of really crazy stories that didn't make it into the book or things that you guys wanted to write about, but you, you just couldn't get confirmation or, or anything like that? Um, there was one thing we didn't put in, which subsequently the, um, I think the New York Post has reported, which was Kim Kardashian 
was given a white uh, and Chris, what was her husband called? Chris Hudson? Chris, her Chris former Humphrey, husband. Humphreys. Chris, Chris Humphreys. Humphreys. The, the, the two of them had been given by Jolo at a, at a wedding, a white Ferrari. And then of course they got divorced a few days later and all the wedding guests were complaining that their gifts had not been returned. But there was a, a mention in a, in a legal uh, filing, I think by Chris Humphreys, that, that you know, I haven't got my fair share of the wedding gifts, including a white Ferrari from a, uh, a Malaysian businessman. And I think the New York, the New York uh, Post has confirmed that was Jolo. Um, and so that, that, I don't know where that white Ferrari is. I have, a, I have a, an interest in, in finding out whether that was ever given back to the US government or not, or whether Kim Kardashian still has that car. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I mean, the stories, every single time you hear one of these, right? It's just like so crazy how entrenched he was into U.S. politics, culture, uh, kind of business. I mean, he literally was able to infiltrate oh, we, everything. Well we, haven't even, well, we haven't even talked about how he tried to infiltrate the White House. He tried to do with Obama the same thing he had done with, you know, the Malaysian prime minister, the, the powers that be in the Middle East. He actually met Obama once. Um, he got close to a guy that was, that was an Obama fundraiser. Um, he, who was a sort of distant relation of Michelle Obama. And he, he gave, that guy was a businessman and he did all these sort of weird business deals that made that guy a bunch of money. Um, but of course, it's not as easy to infiltrate the White House as it is to, to do that with Malaysia and, uh, and the Middle East. And so he wasn't, he wasn't really all that successful in getting that close to Obama. But he did, he did via Pras Michelle, who, I don't, do you know who Pras Michelle is? I do not. Yeah, this is a, this is a generational thing. Pras Michelle was the, the rapper from the Fugees you know, the Lauren Hill uh, group. Um, so Pras Michel, who literally opens our book, became a really good friend of Jolo's. Um, and he, he illegally, well, allegedly illegally contributed to the Obama re-election campaign because of course foreigners are not allowed to uh, uh, contribute into US politics. But Jolo used Pras Michel as a straw man, allegedly to pay, uh, to put money into a super PAC for Obama's re-election. So that was all part of his attempts to get closer to to the White House. And Pras Michel was facing a bunch of, of problems because when all this came out, Jolo also tried to get the Department of Justice to drop all these investigations into 1MDB. And he, he actually offered Pras Michel $300 million if they were able to, Pras Michel had a friend of the Department of Justice and they were working to try to influence the investigations in some way. And then, and yeah, all of that stuff is, all that stuff didn't work out either. So fascinating. It, it, yeah, it's one of these things <laughs> where uh, when people have money to just throw around, I mean, $300 million is crazy. And uh, I think there's a story at one point there in um, somewhere in Europe, maybe, uh, maybe a visa or something. And they're like at a club. And he's basically just spending, you know, a million, two million bucks at the club on a single night. And you're just like, look, you know, you start doing the math. That's a lot of bottles or that's, you know, a lot of really expensive bottles of alcohol to spend $2 million in a, in a club in a single night. Well, yeah, that was, you're referring to, a, a, he got into a, a, bat, a champagne battle with Winston Fisher, who's a, a New York real estate family. And they were, they were bidding each other in the, in the Cave du Roi, which is a, a famous uh, nightclub in, it's actually in um, uh, Saint-Tropez, not Ibiza. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, they sort of bid each other up to some crazy number. I think it was 2 million euro in the end. It was, it was, he would go into a club and just say, ah, crystal for everybody, you know? And so people quite enjoyed hanging with that. And there, there's, there's, a, there's another sort of famous scene in the book where they do a double dateline uh, New Year's Eve. They go to Sydney and then they go to uh, Las Vegas. And, you know, Jamie Foxx is in the plane and uh, Swiss Beats is in the plane. And there's all these photos on Instagram, you know, of them just have buckets of crystal everywhere. Yeah, I think people are kind of sick of this. <laughs> a absolutely insane. Um, talk to me a little bit just about, uh, you wrote this book, went super deep on, on this specific fraud and, and kind of really unpacked like how a fraud comes together, how uh, it gets enabled and, and kind of what the money, you know, what, what people do with the money. How do you think about this getting repeated in the future, right? Whether it's now during kind of COVID and the economic recession um, or, or maybe at some other time, like are you looking for kind of the next, you know, one MDB type scandal um, or, or do you kind of just wait for them to come to you? It's a hundred percent going to happen again. I mean, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, a case that's also rolling on right now, very similar involving Credit Suisse and Mozambique where they, they bought a bunch of tuna fishing boats. The government bought some fishing boats and they took out a $2 billion loan with uh, via Credit Suisse and some other banks and a couple of Credit Suisse bankers have been charged, I think, for, it is a very similar thing, you know, uh, huge loans from the market, a uh, country without rule of law on one side. Um, and that, that's, you know, that's a big problem. 
I mean, look, I talk to my Goldman uh, friends and they say you can't get, it's hard to get deals through now because you've got to go through extra stringent procedures at the Capital Commitments Committee and all of this. Um, and there are good people at Goldman, of course, it's not like full of people like Tim Leitzner. Um, and, and does banking fill a function in our world? Yeah, it does. But I think at the margins, there's always going to be people uh, who want to make big bonuses and are under pressure to make big, their, their big, uh, you know, deals. And, you know, they're not that easy to come by. That's the big secret in banking, right? It's just not that easy, especially if you're in a fairly small market like Southeast Asia, like Tim Leisner was. You want to make partner, you got to do a big deal. And how do you, you know, if you're doing deals in China right now with Chinese companies, how do you know? You, sometimes you don't even know who owns a Chinese company. It might claim to be private, maybe the government's behind it. And so it's very hard to do the kind of due diligence you need to do to stop these frauds happening. And um, you could argue they're just part of the way, you know, capitalism works. You need, it'll happen. And, but you need, you need open markets. You need, you need this for the, for, the, for the way our world works. But you need to also have regulators who crack down on it, I think. And that's the key. Yeah, and, and it feels in some weird way, you know, you see the kind of luck in coffees in China that come out and, you know, I think yeah. the consensus in the market is that it was some sort of fraud or scam or whatever. And, and there's almost like two categories, right? There's the like, oh, that they were just lying about their numbers. And so there was financial engineering going on or there's like this, which is, hey, they fraudulently got access to billions of dollars. And then they went and they spent it on Ferraris and, you know, yachts and jets and kind of all the, the crazy glitterati type lifestyle. And to your point, I think that the, the more traditional like corporate fraud of just, hey, I said I have X number in revenue, but I didn't, uh, almost has been, we've been desensitized to some degree to that. It's this yeah. type of stuff now yeah. where people are, you know, they're still blown away when they see somebody got hold of six or $7 billion in cash and then went and literally blew it across the world, uh, you know, with the rich and famous in the world. Well, I mean, I, I mean, yes, I think, I think you made a great point. I mean, I listened to the We Crashed podcast about WeWork, right? And I'm like, well, that's no, no one's saying Adam Newman did anything fraudulent, okay? But we have become desensitized because, you know, how are the stewards of that company allowing that kind of spending to go on, right? Um, and I think that's probably how Jolo, in his own mind, would justify his actions. He'd say, look, I'm, I was just doing what, you know, the Jordan Belforts of the world did. And, you know, this is just how, this is how smart people make the most of this system, right? Um, and, you know, we didn't want to make the book too preachy or anything, but I think there's a couple of moments where we try to say, look, I mean, if we, if we want the system, and it's all tied up with everything that's going on right now, inequality and, and people's sense of like, I'm working on a, on a you know, $6 an hour job or whatever it is, um, they, they're sick of that and they see all this. Um, if, you don't, if you don't like make it more equitable, then the system's just not going to work in the long run, so. And, and one of the last questions I have before we get into some rapid fire questions to finish up is just, he made, he financed the Wolf of Wall Street. And so there's some irony in a fraud financing a movie about one of the most famous American frauds in history. What was your take on that? And, and kind of, was that more of a, I've got to tell this, and this is like a bat signal to the world that I'm a fraud, or was it just coincidence? How, how did you guys kind of look at that? Well, I think it's like uh, it, it follows on from what we were just saying. I don't think Jolo is is that smart or into literature to think that it was so meta that he had to do such a meta move. I don't think that was what was going on. But I think he was attracted by the the people like Jordan Belfort, um, and he was attracted by DiCaprio, you know, who had played Jay Gatsby, you know, in the in in um, Baz Luhrmann's film of The Great Gatsby. And so this was this was a very meta situation where you know, Jolo was was meeting Jordan Belford and, and DiCaprio, was, who was a character actor, was meeting Jolo. I mean, DiCaprio says he didn't know he was a, a fraud at the time. Um, but I don't know, I don't think he had any sort of great um, intellectual idea that this was such a meta move. I just think he was attracted to those kind of people because he, he and he saw it as sort of a valid, you know, you're a loser in capitalism if you don't make these kind of, you know, badass moves, probably something just like that. Absolutely insane. Uh, I asked two questions to, uh, to wrap it up and then you could ask me one uh, as the last one, but uh, what is the most important book that you've ever read? Oh, most important. Well, one of my favorite books is The Sheltering Sky, um, which is, which is a, actually I've got it here on my, on my bookshelf, I think. But it's by a guy, it's a guy called Paul Bowles and it's a fantastic, fantastic novel um, set in sub-Saharan Africa. That's, 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 what, that's my favorite sort of fiction. In terms of uh, important book of nonfiction, um, 
Well, I've just read uh, Rutger Bregman's book about happiness, um, which is, uh, sh shall I just step up and pick it up very quickly? Sure, go ahead. Hang, hang on. For those that are, uh, are listening, uh, Tom is literally going to the bookcase behind him right now and, uh, and grabbing the book, which is, uh, makes him an expert because he knows exactly where the book is. <laughs> well, I just read it. So, so this, this book, uh, Humankind, by a, a very smart young Dutch thinker, is it's trying to, it's, it's, it's sort of like, um, it goes against the grain of the Jared Diamonds, you know, and the, the Steven Pinkers and, and all this idea, well, actually maybe not, more, more Jared Diamond, this idea that, you know, humans are bad and that, and that um, you know, we have a deep core of badness. And he's trying to say, look, we have, we, we actually are deep down um, good people. And, and he spins it into a fantastic, a fantastic book. And um, he starts off by talking about the famous Lord of the Flies, uh, William Golding's book. And he finds a real life example of boys who were marooned in the Pacific and they did not end up almost killing each other. They cooperated and they kept the fire going and all of that. I just found this, a, I found that a fantastic book, really, really great read. And, and the author's name is Rutger Bregman? Rutger Bregman. He's the guy, you might remember him. He went to, he went to, he, he's the guy who went to Davos and to, to all the TED Talks um, and uh, sort of uh, talked about basic income and all that kind of stuff. And he's, he's sort of like the anti-Davos guy. Uh, very, very smart, very, very well written, br brilliantly written book, yeah. I love that. Uh, the second question is a little bit more fun, which is aliens, believer or non-believer? Non-believer. Wow. Why, why uh, non-believer? Um, just a rationalist, atheist. Um, <laughs> you know what? I haven't even given it much thought. I don't, I've never been that pulled to, you know, stargazing and thinking about what's out there. I, I, I think, you know, like, I'm always amazed when I read history that, that like, I just think most of it's probably made up when you look back at like people talk about Herodotus or something. We, we, we can't, I couldn't, to even know what happened between 2009 and 2015 with this one MDB fraud was difficult enough, right? And getting multiple sources on, on things. So I find like, um, you know, whether aliens exist or not is so far beyond, you know, my comprehension, I, yeah, I wouldn't even go there. I recently tweeted saying that uh, one of the greatest lies we tell ourselves uh, lies in our memory. Right, our, just our personal memories are so bad, yet we have a hard time admitting that to ourselves. And so if your memory's bad, yeah. imagine how poorly history is written, right, from an accuracy standpoint. Exactly, exactly. That's why I like dealing in narrative nonfiction, because you, it's not opinion, you just find out what happened and, and you, you, know, you, don't, you try to give as little opinion as possible. Um, I don't know how all these columnists, uh, you know, and also there's so much opinion right now, if you, if you go on Twitter or uh, so much posturing, and so little actual reporting amongst, amongst some of the younger journalists, I hate to say. But yeah, I feel like you just need to get facts because that's the only way to, to, to go forward. Absolutely. Uh, you get to ask me one question to finish up. What's the uh, one question you have? Yeah, so I, I've noticed that, that there's amongst people who are into, into Bitcoin, this book is very popular because they, they, they keep making the argument, well, this huge fraud shows that uh, you know, fiat currencies are, are not the way to go when it comes to stopping fraud. But I don't, I, I'm not sure I buy that either. I feel like Bitcoin is, is also going to be a great enabler of fraud. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so, well, so there's two pieces to that. So uh, I've definitely seen a lot of people who, who say that. Um, I, I think that there's kind of two parts to the fraud, which is could something uh, disincentivize or prevent the fraud from occurring? And then is there something on the back end once the fraud has happened, would it be better for it to have happened in fiat or in uh, cryptocurrency or in Bitcoin or whatever it is? Um, I, I definitely am with you that I don't think that Bitcoin or fiat or really any currency in the world would necessarily uh, prevent this from happening, right? Money is money and bad people are going to figure out bad things to do. And so there's bad people who use Bitcoin for things. There's bad people who use US dollars and, and every other currency in the world. So I, I kind of don't buy that argument. I think what uh, the argument that I see, um, I see the uh, validity of, yet I don't think necessarily uh, people have kind of thought through the, the second and third order effects of is, oh, if Bitcoin had been used, you then could, because it is a public ledger, basically track down the funds easier. Uh, technically, yes, or kind of from an academic standpoint. But as we've discussed, if you take the currency, again, whatever currency it is, and you turn it into assets, it kind of, you, you get back to square one, right? So like if I take right. it, you know, whether it's US dollars or Bitcoin, I turn it into a $35 million jet, you still got to go find the jet. Right. And, and so I, I think that 
yes, if it was all sitting in cash, you could track it down or at least kind of get a better picture if it was in Bitcoin versus fiat. Uh, but, but once it's in assets, I think, you know, it kind of doesn't really matter. Um, in, in terms of like just Bitcoin on a grander scheme, to me, it really comes down to uh, you're either going to have government controlled currencies or you're going to have separation of state and money. Right. And I always tell people it's like the separation of state and money is probably uh, low probability, but it's possible. Right. So you kind of have kind of, you have possibility, but low probability. And uh, if it does occur, it will be massive value creation. Right. Because it's kind of one of these, you know, very small chance of happening. But if it happens, it will be so outrageous in terms of value creation. And, and I think that's also kind of pulls certain types of people into it where they say, you know, I want the one in a million chance of getting rich, right, or, or, or whatever. And so I try to spend a lot of time talking people back into reality a little bit and like, hey, you know, put 1% of your assets there and like, you're good. <laughs> and if it happens, it happens, great. But like, don't go put 99% of all of your money in Bitcoin and cross your fingers and hope, you know, it turns into uh, kind of a trillion dollar asset. But uh, there's, I mean, literally there's people who tweeted me all the time and they're like, hey, you know, somebody tweeted me yesterday. It was like 94% of my wealth is in Bitcoin and Ether. And all I could think to myself is like, Jesus, that is not a smart move. <laughs> so I don't know. Like free, free financial advice. Sorry. Right, good. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Like, you know, I, I, uh, I joke with my partners all the time. Like I never thought that as an investor, I would spend time telling people like put less money in. Right. Cause most investors are always saying like, Hey, you, you know, you, you can do more, you can do more. But with this one asset, it, it's just so volatile. And uh, I think it definitely attracts kind of a certain personality type that you literally have to talk to people kind of off the edge and be like, Hey, just chill out. You'll be all right. Like cash is not, you know, horrible. You can hold some cash. You'll be, you'll be good. Um, so, so I think it's funny. Where uh, where can people find the uh, the book if they want to uh, go buy it? I know there's an audio book and then also uh, it's copies. yeah it's everywhere it's everywhere Amazon Barnes and Noble um, it's in all the bookstores um, and we should say um, we're making a film out of it uh, the, the the film company that made Crazy Rich Asians if you saw that film mm. uh, in 2018 they they've bought the rights to it and so they're turning it into a uh, probably into a TV series um, so that's in progress yeah so very exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, for everyone who's listening, uh, I almost never give book recommendations, but this is one that I highly suggest uh, going to read because it's, uh, it one, I read it very quickly, but also two, as you walk away with this rare combination, I think of kind of the entertainment factor of a lot of the stuff we talked about here, but you also learn, you know, just how does the global financial system really work, especially in areas where you've got U.S based financial organizations operating in other countries or other regions. And, and you just kind of get a different picture of the world. And, uh, you know, Tom is uh, based in Asia. And so I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, that definitely helps you write from kind of a non-Western perspective, uh, yeah. w which is uh, pretty compelling as well. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. It's, uh, well, we had a rule that we would have only one, uh, one page of money flow before you get back to something else, because otherwise people don't read. People, corruption's important, but people don't care to read about corruption, right? So yeah, it's not, a, it's not a book about corruption. It's not a book about money trail. There is some money trail in there, but you can always just skip over that if you. <laughs> they, they just want to know about the parties and, uh, and the yachts and the jets, man. That, that's all. And the way, and, I, I mean, and the way the world really works, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Tom, listen, thank you so much for doing this. I, I think with the recent Thanks news with the Goldman uh, settlement, people are just super interested to kind of hear from you. So uh, as we learn more, we'll have to do it again in the future. Thanks, dude. I enjoyed it.